I'll start with a little bit of a motivator. Innovation, if you happen to have it once, it's because you are bright or you're super intelligent. Innovation twice, the probability of just right becomes lower. Innovation repeatedly means somehow, systematically, over other people, you tend to spend your idea on the winner. Ideas and 10% on losing while someone else is spending 50-50. And experimentation platform, the primary goal is to help you get there. From the blindingly obvious, then you go to clear, detailed, deep, but deductive reasoning to something which is multidimensional, which could have interaction with other things in n different ways and it boggles the mind. That's where you need A-B testing. And another key area is segmentation. If it's, let's give an example. You ordered a book. You should get the book, no brainer. Should you get the book half a day earlier than your SLA? How much of a difference would that make to you versus how much money do we lose? Those are the kinds of questions where we do not have a clear answer, where we need help from the demographics, where we need to observe. I love the term incremental radicalism. This is about incremental radicalism. And a small disclaimer, several parts of this platform are not parent flip charts. These are work in progress and we will solicit more inputs, ideas as we go along. So feel free to throw in your thoughts as well. The top components of an experimentation platform, bucketing. You've got to figure out whether the experiment goes to people in the front row, what segment, what's the bucket that receives the experiment. Say, in terms of bucketing, most of the world, every article you read about experimentation platform is about web-based bucketing, where it's an user, pick four things. Simplest one is pick randomly. That is not giving you segmentation. The next level is segmented, segmented, where we go into some cohort and say we are looking for people who have bought books and not bought electronic books so far. And then we try and observe. So that is becoming a bit deeper. And that is the website. That bucketing has to be at web scale. The second level bucketing, a lot of our systems are supply chain systems which are taking the orders, the user is not there, and then doing something with the thing. The next level bucketing is not about the user, it's about the order basket. It doesn't matter that a person, it's not the person X, oftentimes it's about the fact that they have ordered this book before Christmas, should this go out in a day. Control variables are typically, so the first step was bucketing, then you control some variable, you toggle it, maybe I'll show the price to be 10 rupees lower for a book all over the country, to see whether the demand spikes up. Gift wrap, position on the web page, recommendation positioning, these are the control variables that we see. After we tweak the control variables, typically it's not very trivial to come up with what should be the outcome. As an e-commerce company, again, I'm open to discussions on this, so feel free to put in your inputs as well. As an e-commerce company, I can think of repeat visit, repeat buy, repeat engagement. Engagement is beyond a read where they update a comment, do an active search, just not just browsing, and a trend in the spending. These are the four things that I could think of with some discussions as well for result variables, and then comes result interpretation. Result interpretation, it's non-trivial. You go from z-test, t-test, chi-square, f-test. You've heard of a lot of different tests. We will talk a little about some of these, and you will start to see some of the nuances. And the real reason why, why people don't do experiments, let's go over it. Bucketing is non-trivial. It's not simple to do a complex predicate which says, I want people who have bought books with increasing spend and not bought electronics. It's an, a simple
simple curiosity cannot be entertained very easily. Control variables. It's not configurable. So you have to code. You need someone else. Result variables. If you had to do this analysis today without the platform, you would have to build out these four things. Result interpretation. Again, unless you're deep in statistics, not everyone in a company is deep in statistics. That's not expected. It's non-trivial. To talk a little bit about some of the cohorts that we can think of. Users, we talked about this. How would you evaluate something like this? Who bought books, did not buy electronics, increased spending. You could do it on the fly, but probably not the wisest thing to do. Because you are doing this at Westfield. And by the way, if you have questions, feel free to be clear. User to activity. Even if the person is not a user, if I have a cookie to activity, those are good ways to start segmenting. segmenting. And typically, you will evaluate these rules, possibly offline, populate a cache, so that when, so when someone's live, you immediately know what to do. Should this person be served this banner? Should this person get a gift voucher showing up on the screen? It's, it's basically cached, and this is done usually offline, a lot of it, unless the rules are trivial. And in an e-commerce, the rules will probably not be trivial. You will do a lot of trivial segments. Key thing here is cohorts need to be selected declaratively. Categories, first, what, what do I mean by that? You don't want people writing code for it. You want some way to express on an UI as much as possible. Category first is search ranking for boost, email marketing, something boosted, spend slope above this, below this, or total spend in the last month. A few variables which we can allow people to fill out on a web form and they pick the cohort. Let's go to the other side. Supply chain. The reason I go is that this is very different from the first bit. First bit, you have to go, first part on the website, the computations are complex and it's in the synchronous flow of the user being there on the site. You have to have the results be done. You don't want complex rule evaluation. This side, the bucketing and fulfillment, oftentimes the rules will be a little simpler because it's on the order basket. It's at order scale, not at web scale. You do the usual conversion math and you'll get some small, some percentage of the website visitors viewing, coming to place an order. And it's on the order basket. It's saying, okay, people who have ordered digital goods, fast not ordered something else, we, in this basket we will apply this to you. Or people whose orders have come to Mumbai warehouse will get this. Typically, we have to look for, typically this is a rules evaluation. The Riti algorithm is essentially when the number of rules is very large, we can keep evaluating every predicate for every order. It becomes very bulky. You rearrange the hierarchy of the rules so that the rules fire the minimal number of times. And there are ways to do it. That is probably the right way to have this aspect taken care of. So an order is there. You have the order basket. You have the website experiments that are associated with it. Supply chain evaluates with the Riti algorithm. And then this is on the fly evaluation. Couple of things to look for. Age and gender. Age we do not always, do not often know. You can try to infer. Gender, you can have a reasonable qualifier, which is the number of vowels and vowel ending names. Unless if a person self-identifies, that's great. If not, vowels are a good indicator. That is a cohort, yes. So very good, actually good point. So there are direct cohorts which are derived by direct knowledge. 
then you can have indirect cohorts where I believe, say, the recommendations team is usually right in their recommendation. And I'm going to layer it, my behavior on the recommendations that they are putting up, saying that if the recommendation contains a camera, my assumption is that this complex map that has happened behind it, then I will give a camera gift voucher, or I'll give an SD card gift voucher. So this is on the U. Absolutely. So that is all part of user bucketing. Yes. So user characteristics include the user's location, include trends in the user's location, gender of the user, and then the buying behavior, visit behavior, and so on. Yes. Good. So typically, you'll have exclusive buckets on the control variables. Example, the two. Two experiments cannot both decide on gift wrapping. Con control variables are things which are going to be frequently experimented. Let's think this through. What is frequently experimented in, say, retail? Oftentimes it's pricing. We don't really know whether it should be five rupees more or five rupees less, or does it even matter? So what, what would be nice is to say price equals Declared price plus experiment deviation. So when you call when it's called it once, it's saying experiment deviator, and experiment deviator is coming based on the experiment experiment that is triggered for this user from a configuration survey. This part's clear. Okay, so experiment deviator would be let's see. Say a recommendation mixing algorithm ratio. Price is a good, good one. Gift wrap. These are toggles. So normally it would be no, but you also or it with an experiment deviator, which says for this experiment, if, the, if this experiment of gift wrapping applies to this user, give him a gift wrap, even though this item would not normally qualify. And then we study the user for the subsequent months for repeat buy, repeat visit, all of those things. Good. Much more complex will be if we change the business flow on an experiment item. But that needs to be business process management where nodes move around in the flow of things. What does execution look like? Actually, another good example with this. So if we are lucky, we find our control variable that is a frequently experimented thing right there as a control variable which we can toggle with configuration and launch an experiment. If experiment 45, otherwise you have to write code. Say experiment 45 was touching a non-control variable. That is, it cannot be changed with configuration. Then we'll have to do some coding in some place. If experiment 45, some client library, checks both the region rules, checks, checks the supply ch chain side rules, checks the website cache of whether this is applied. Then configuration-based deviators would be an experiment delta, experimenting with early delivery, one day early delivery, that is a delta which we will apply. This delta is coming from a config survey or experiment 42 config survey. So there's also probably many of you know about the multi-armed bandit or not. Let me just talk a bit through it. Multi-armed bandit is basically try something in random and then be greedy for more specifics. 90% greedy and 10% random. So what you're essentially doing is maximizing. So you could have multi-armed bandit for changing things with your A-B testing. Usually, I like to look and look at the interactions and things there before I do it. 
but there are many who advocate just leaving the cross unexpanded, take it and toggle it, and finally they get there. Okay? A little bit of math. It's not too much. So, at large numbers, what you, what you will get is actually there's a God-given or whatever tendency of people to buy or not buy, given your site, given the, the, the market. So what you have is probability P plus some skew, which is the probability of not accepting, which is 1 minus P, to the power N, which is there N people trying it out. Basic binomial. Why does the normal, basically the normal distribution come out reasonable, and when it does not, I'll go a little into that. So what you get is a summation of this. N combination R, P to the power R, Q, N minus R, P to the remember in general, complete R, etc. If you did this, imagine that I did not draw it out, but imagine that there is a distribution with the binomial somewhat like this, and at Y R, what you would have is this thing. Good, good, good. So R is where you have exactly R successes. Okay? Thank you. R successes. So it's choosing R successes into the site. So usually you're looking for what is the shape of this distribution where you get successes and failures on the site. If you did, say, distribution hour by hour, you would come up with a normal distribution. People choosing by binomial will end up with, if there are n people coming in, the probability that r of them will convert is this. Clear so far? So if you did this math, there's a little more that goes in between. y r plus 1 minus y r divided by y r, and it's a large n. After a bunch of steps, you would come to this thing. And this will, if you integrate it, you will get to the normal distribution. So assumption, large n, assumption, you will have to take into account, say, if, if it's deviating hour to hour, this is assuming that it's somewhat constant through the day, reasonable assumption, and also the number of samples that you have. If you have very few samples, then you do not do pure normal distribution. Though the underlying curve is normal, you will have to do what is called a G-plot, which is a slight, looks similar to normal, but a slightly fatter tail. Somewhat clear so far? Oh, okay. How is the hourly distribution kind of Throughout the day, people don't shop the same way. True. Sure. So the pattern is different. I'm not saying that hourly distribution is the same. However, the aggregate of many normal distributions again becomes a normal distribution, though it's scaled in different ways. So usually the normal distribution over a large period somewhat holds. And if you've got enough samples, it will hold. When would you not have enough samples? Oftentimes, the more specific one, specific you get into, say, supply chain problem, is the website is often at web scale. Say, in India, if the mobile side is much slower, you're, having, you're going to have a lot harder time on a specific product page on the mobile. So th then you may not do pure normal like this. You may end up doing a T-plot. And on the... On the order scale, it's much smaller than the web scale. So you will again have to look a bit deeper and probably go again p-test if it's very specific to the product. I'm not sure if that I am confusing you. Maybe I can give you an easy one. Maybe you can give us the three results of all the things you did. Okay. And number two, uh, let me in going back to your crazy algorithm. Do you see a whole bunch of false bumps when you do a new distribution? So a new 
me ta- let, let me take them one by one real quick. A new category, oftentimes we have no idea where to begin. So a good way that I find to begin is attribute similarity. So cosine similarity with attributes of some other product or cosine similarity possibly with a similar product sold by someone else. If I know the Alexa rankings, that's probably what I'm going to expect as the top distribution to the funnel. And then further down, I will think about it. Even for, say, it was very difficult to pack perfumes for whatever reason. And supply chain needs to do, say, massive amount of work. How many perfumes are you likely to get orders for? So for that sort of a thing, you could look at Alexa distribution of someone else and then come to this funnel down here. So if you're looking for peak on a given day, this normal, when you take it, extrapolate, it will come out to be more of a poisson, but that's different. What was your second question? Interaction. Oh, self-canceling rules. So with the Riti algorithm, whether you have, when you have different rules firing for the same user, say with an opinion on gift wrap, what you typically have to do, it, it does not automatically. You have to set priority, and you also have to attribute correctly. Because though, say, the individual, say, Shashwat, was eligible for three experiments on gift wrap. One said, give him a gift wrap. Second said, don't give him. Third said, give him. So we may do the giving him, and then we both attribution. This one was an I- interesting, n- interesting plot. I got it out of healthier stats from OkCupid data where they took dating sites and figured out a plot of interaction, interaction plot. I'll tell you why I'm pulling up the interaction plot. It is very, very easy to forget that your experiments are overlapping. And you will have three, four different things running in parallel. How do they interfere? Is there an actual interaction? It's non-trivial to say. The reason I brought this up is because if you're trying to pull off by just eyeballing it, you're not going to think of the interaction. You don't even know the super set of experiments that are running. They are overlapping. Let's, let's see what this says. This was, I think, uh, on the site, new contacts monthly for uh, women when they made a flirty face, smiling, not smiling, with and without eye contact. Okay? What, what you read out of it, let's, let's look at it. Between smile and no smile, with or without eye contact did not seem to change the effectiveness. This is the effectiveness of how many eye contact you have. With and without is parallel. There is no significant interaction. Let's look at this. Flirty face has a huge interaction with eye contact. With eye contact, flirty face works a lot better. So the basic point is that your experiments may not be making flirty faces, but they will have interactions with other experiments. And you will not be able to pull it off without a lot deeper look across the board. And it is powerful to look at the experiments, let, let, let's take a look. If you, if you had aggregate data, say an experiment which said eye contact, no eye contact, versus say eye contact is marginally better than say some other attribute. You, you may not pull out that this interaction is going to be the most effective. It's the cross of two different experiments. And that recommendation will not come out of you eyeballing through your own experiments. Okay? Basic result interpretation. This, go, this can go very, very deep. So key test, usually samples less than 30. It's a fatter tail. It gives looks similar to normal. It's not really the normal distribution, so it's a fatter tail. Z test is the normal distribution, 
hand you look for, how much 95% confidence limit, what's the probability that you are out there. Paired p-test, right, another very beautiful one. Let's look at, say, say Ashish bought, a, bought an item, had a terrible experience, then you call him, apologize to him, and does he buy again? If you, t if you do not pair his receipt buy with that call, if you just have calls and buys separately, it's not going to be a valid result. It's not as simple as a bucketing initially, basic bucketing. He is already in the bucket because we've apologized and we have discussed it further. So paired p-tests kick in pretty deeply. We look at chi-square for power of a, of a statistic. To give some idea, you may get p-values. Yeah, that is it. That is it. There are always three points. So the power, so typically p-value is talking about when your mean comes somewhere here mean with some experiment is coming somewhere here or here, whether it's enough of an outlier to be very low probability. Let's give a simple test. Do we lose anything by repeated testing until a test converges? Yes, no? Give a test, I don't like this. What, say it again? Okay. What if I could figure out and get, show it to different sets of people so that it's not the same people both times. Hmm? Temporal context is lost. What if I ran 20 at the same time, 20 sets of the bucket, and one of them shows conclusion? 95, 99. Okay. Good guess but I would disagree, and here's why. Look very carefully, this is actually the, can you guys see, is it? Thank you. So, thank you, Sora, for the pen. This is super helpful, I think. That was your A-B test. <laughs> with the pen, <laughs> with the pen it works. So, if, what it says when you say confidence is at 95%, it means that only 5% is in this space. If you ran it many, many times, one of them showing at least once in the high confidence limit does not mean that it is actually converging. If it's 19 times out of 20, so think of it this way. There's a five, essentially what we said, 5% probability that the mean here is in same population. If I do this test, 5% or less, if I do it 20 times, very probable that one of those 20 will say, yeah, it's in the same population when it's mistakenly in there. So repeating the test until you see results pop out is not a great way. There's, it's like, it's literally at least once. It's like saying, I believe that coins give three heads in a row and flipping the coin until it gives three heads in a row. It did, but your conclusion is not there. Very interesting. And this is something many, many schools do as well. Let's think, what does this do if this is the development paradigm? Scalability. Where do we spend most of our time? We spend most of our time trying to scale things, make it more available, sharding in databases, all these complicated things. Performance, what, did, what would we do if we were doing experiments? 90% of the experiments and more would actually, despite good in initial intuition, would be wrong. Because they're not blindingly obvious anymore. There's trade-offs and something falls apart. So what you end up doing is you don't have to do scalability as much. Try it in a small subsystem, small set of people. Availability. Allow the system to fail open. Fail open means if the machine goes down, they don't get this data. No one dies. It's a lot simpler to do this. Performance. 
If you're in memory, even reading off of a text file, a large text file, for a few people, you don't need databases, you don't need that much, it's in memory, it will perform. When you have to perform at scale, we have to do work. Only thing that we would do differently is figuring out control variables. Let's figure out what other variables we will move around. So typically, you will find no more than 10% of your experiments will need to be written out for you. So you will be saving time on all of these massively. Scalability, availability, it changes the design paradigm a lot. Try it out for two weeks, move on to something else, we'll come back, validate our hypothesis, and then move on. It's not very difficult if you want to do it for a few weeks. Decision paradigm. No code needed to test most ideas because most ideas are on control variables which are the most frequent we experiment with this. Experiments run in parallel, possibly hundreds. Experiments, when you make every idle curiosity very easy to validate or invalidate, a lot of things run in parallel. We are finding interaction clocks and interaction diagrams under the cover. No need to test for interaction details explicitly. You'll get all of this gradually with the time. Okay, short summary. A-B testing platform becomes key beyond the trivially obvious. Configuration, you base on A-B tests and you, you make it trivial to make an A-B test. So you configure driven variables, which are the most frequent used, get toggles or tweaked variables. Result interpretation is non-trivial and it varies a lot with interaction, a lot of different things. So it's worth the platform, worth having it there as an organization moves from the blindingly obvious to the segmented, multi-dimensional impact, not so obvious thing. In short, I would say, be brave, but don't be too brave, you will be wrong. The extra kick in your coffee did not make you any more intelligent. The warm shower did not make you any more intelligent. It just made you feel a little better. And your predecessors have also tried things and not gotten there. So it's not that, not that the ideas aren't good, but the likelihood is not terribly high. But we have to make it cheap to try out a whole lot of ideas. Feel free to try things out, have no fear in experimenting, have fear when putting things fully live on the site at full scale. Try every experiment, make it very trivial to accomplish. And I think that's a big differentiator. That's the difference in my mind between a once, once flash in the pan versus repeated experiments. So there's a few questions. building something, so Very good point. Actually, it's not just that good things happen. More often than not, you are trying to move, say, conversion, and it happens, and it drops order. 
or sorry, it click happens, but it somehow still drops order. Or click happens, it drops engagement. It drops the sweet spot. So it's not just the instantaneous, it's also some more buckets. Like, okay, people come back at frequency of 15 days. These are people who come back every 15 days, three times a week. You showed them this red border camera and they don't come back for the next 30 days. You flip yellow. So the ba basically the result variable, you are targeting one, but there's three to four others. I talked about four and would be happy to hear more such variables. We should be cognizant and looking for effect on all those and statistically significant. Maybe it is statistically significant on, say, engagement, but dropping the numbers are not. So there you go. media, some others work on it specifically. I do not know every experiment that is being tracked, but there are some admins and some other people who are kind of experimenting on it and they're kind of getting some feedback on it. Hello. I think the experiment is about altering the value of a parameter. Mm -hmm. We do not know what is the optimum value there. We have made an estimate and we came out with number. We sure. want to test that, but that number, we expect that the number should dynamically change depending upon how the users are reacting to it. So basically it's an AP bucket where the parameter is dynamically getting changed based on user's reaction. So that tends to be more like the multi on bandit thing that we were talking about. Then we need dynamic changes. Usually at least for the initial changes, I like to watch more carefully as opposed to just automatic changing. But y yes, what he's talking about is dynamically changing the price curve or sure. So, so basic idea is 90% or so of the thing picks the greedy approach. So greedy approach is step. So there's something with casinos and where a multi-armed bandit is trying to do stuff and put in coins and win. So you go with the slot machine which is giving the most, but you keep trying with 10% you do random. The reason you do random is that if something, some other slot machine becomes preferable, you start to pick that slot machine. So it's adjusting. So multi-armed bandit is a good way to adjust. So many will say that A-B testing is a more conscious approach where we are watching and doing things. Multi-armed bandit is where you write 10 strategies and you're studying a control variable, uh, studying a result variable, and all 10 strategies, the one which is winning gets picked more often. Good, very beautiful way to say it. <laughs> trust, chance to, trust chance to help you figure out. Or, or is it similar to, let's say, in the home page, in some module, I have black color and blue color. Mm -hmm. Now, I put the red color. Yes. And I want to adapt the best color of the lab using the AB bucket. Yes, sure. So I'll randomly keep on showcasing different products and selectively evaluate which four products are performing the best. So this then is a dynamic thing. Yes, I do agree that multi on bandit that you're talking about would be a very good approach to it because I'm constantly toggling, and this is a good different kind of problem where there's a temporal aspect, and even if I come up with the right mix, it may not be the right mix going forward. So the temporal aspect implies that you will, you will try a multi on bandit to converge in different segments of time. Okay, I have a question. Um, so far, um, you have been talking about user level experience. Mm -hmm. um, is there any risk in doing a visit level experiment on this on this topic? So on the let's specific on, on a specific session experiment. or yeah. whatever. So let's say a user sees something on a Monday and I try showing him something on Tuesday. 
ルックの,あの人にでですね、ミッキーハウス・ルックの人にですね、あの言われていることがあって、それを皆さんに伝えたいと思います。Thank you very much.